So I'd like you all to listen to this story and picture it in your minds. Imagine your favorite family holiday gathering. Maybe it's outside in the summertime, kids running around the yard. Maybe it's winter, you're going into a warm house with the smell of a fireplace in the air. You're gathering friends and family, sharing stories of the new, reminiscing about the old. Maybe you exchange some gifts, light off some fireworks, or sing your favorite holiday songs. Then, as time goes on, you say your goodbyes, family packs up, they get in the car, they head away, and you look forward to the next holiday, the next year. Is there something I'm missing? <laughs> what about the food? <laughs> when are we going to eat? There's no holiday without sharing a meal together with your family and friends. If you think about it, there's no first date without sharing a meal together. There's no travel without trying some new food. There's no family wedding without a big feast. So food is a central part of our humanities, communication, culture, our gathering. It's something we all have in common, and yet all have individual unique ways of expressing. So why am I here to talk about food, if we all do it? Well, I think there's a growing distance between us and our food. I think we've lost connection with the food we eat. Yet, how do you lose connection with something you do three times a day, 21 times a week, over 1,000 times each year? Well, for many people today, food can be a chore, a burden, something you have to do, something you have to stay away from, something you might be allergic to. Many people are saying today, <clears throat> got to watch calorie counting. Fast food, there's fat free. Phrases like, I don't cook, are becoming more and more common. For me, food isn't just a meal. It's not something to do. For me, food is my life. I found this out eight years ago when I became a farmer. So, how did I get here? How do most people become farmers? Majority are born into it. Generations of history, they grow up on the farm, start at a young age, they inherit the family farm and continue it on. For others around the world, farming is the only profession available. They do it out of necessity, it's the only way to survive. None of those were my reasons. I had a different path. In fact, there hasn't been a farmer in my family in over three generations. So, graduated from college eight years ago, 22. I had a degree in international affairs, and I thought I'd work in policy. I'd help save the environment. So, so my first internship, United Nations Development Program, New York City, and I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm reading about farmers who are producing great food. And they're doing it while conserving the environment around them. So I was inspired. I thought, I need to gain some first-hand experience, work on a farm, understand the real food issues facing our country and planet, and I could use this experience as a resume builder, a credential, and I could further my international policy career. Soon, this time on the farm, I realized we don't need more policymakers. We need more farmers. In fact, according to US Census data today, there are more farmers over the age of 75 than there are farmers in their prime working years of 35 to 44. So I thought, if I'm going to have a real impact, I need to be that young farmer, out in the fields, learning the moods of the weather, knowing the seasons, enjoying the hard work, the sunshine, and you know, coming home to food that I'd planted, grown, harvested, and prepared myself. I found out I prefer the dirt over the desk. I found out that growing food is a great way to live. So now, you know a little bit more about me, why I love farming. I'll tell you another story. You wake up, beautiful weekend morning, you say, let's go berry picking. So you get in the car, you drive out to the country, you get to a berry patch, you start picking your berries, popping some into your mouth, they're bursting with flavor, they're delicious. Then all of a sudden, a staff member of the berry patch comes along and says, hey, just, just step out of the patch for a second. Just wait in the parking lot. Come back just a couple minutes. You say, okay. Walk out to the parking lot. He's looking back at the patch. Out comes a large tractor, huge mounted boom sprayer, and just coats the whole field. And then pulls off in the distance. As the cloud clears, the staff member comes back out. Says, hey, come back into the patch. Continue picking. Remember, give the berries a little rinse when you get home. 
How many of you go back in the patch and start picking again? Some would, some wouldn't. But the simple act of going berry picking doesn't seem so simple anymore. Start thinking, what did they just spray? Is it safe? Should I have been eating all those berries before? Now, in reality, no pick your own berry patch sprays it right in front of their customers and tells them to go back in. But this is the unseen reality for all the farmhands who pick the berries that we buy and eat on our grocery store shelves. So what's the difference? Why would you buy that strawberry in the grocery store but not walk back into the patch? The answer is distance. With the right amount of distance, any form of food production seems fine. It's out of sight, out of mind. Not just the physical distance, but growing food has become a distant part of our past. It's drifting out of everyday life. As food drifts out of everyday life, we've grown a detachment from our food. At the same time, we developed an industrial food system. Post-World War II, we took the bomb-making factories, able to fix nitrogen. We turned them into chemical fertilizer plants. We started mass production and distribution of chemical herbicides and pesticides. Companies started waging war on anything unwanted around our food crops, aka killing all the bugs, weeds, insects, anything around our food. Then, at the same time, we started taking our livestock, was once raised on green pastures and spacious barns, started putting them into concentrated feeding operations, start to resemble wartime prison camps. Our once domesticated livestock became incarcerated. With this high cost, high input model took off. The small, traditionally diverse family farm started struggling to survive or even simply giving up. All this, this is all policy. I left this behind. I wanted a simpler route. I just wanted to be a farmer. For the dirt, over the desk. So, for about five years, I was working on a large organic farm in Colorado. It was here I drew a <clears throat> developed a love and respect for the passion and a true understanding of organic. When the farmer I was working for said to me, why would I want to grow a field of crops that I wouldn't feel safe with my own kids walking through? It really became clear. After a couple years on this farm, I started to think, I wanted to start my own farm, my home state of New Jersey. I wanted to bring people in my community closer to agriculture, closer to the plants and animals that they eat, the season they are in, and what it has to offer. So, at about the same time, the perfect opportunity arose at Duke Farms in Hillsborough, New Jersey. It's only 15 miles from where I grew up, and it seemed too good to be true. So, after talking with my wife, Kim, we developed a business plan, we went for the opportunity, we gave it to Duke Farms, and after a short interview process, they accepted us onto their land. And that was three years ago. Fast forward to present day, we have a small farm, growing vegetables, raising livestock on pasture. All of our products are sold directly back to the community we are a part of. Central to our farm is our CSA model, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. With this model, members of the community invest in the farm at the beginning of each season and pick up a weekly or monthly share of the vegetables and meats produced on that farm. Central to this idea is bringing the consumer closer to the food that they eat, developing a direct relationship with the farm that produces their food and the people that are growing it, getting to know them personally. Now, all this talk and action for me can be driven by the love of a good meal. How about for you? How can you fall in love with your food? Well, <clears throat> you need to quit your jobs, start farming in your backyard, <laughs> putting some pigs on your patio. I'm not here to stop you, but there are probably better places to start. Any true love in life is cultivated to some extent. So try getting to know your food a little bit more intimately. Go on a date with your plate. Learn about where it came from, what made it grow, how it was raised. Learn just how the two of you ended up together. <laughs> you want to look for the good not only on the outside, but on the inside as well. And before you know it, you'll be learning more about your food. You'll make better choices. You'll start to enjoy each bite a little bit more. And then, right away, you'll probably start looking out for farmer's markets, trying to find the best produce, the freshest, right in season. 
you find in CSA farms, farmers markets, maybe starting to dig up your backyard a little bit, plant a garden, maybe debate getting some egg laying chickens. Because maybe, in the case of food production, distance does not make the heart grow fonder. We can cultivate and enrich our food culture. We can enrich our lives and enrich the environment we are a part of. We can embrace the act of growing and producing food. And as a result, we can raise more farmers. So by the time I'm a 75-year-old farmer, there'll be 30 and 40-year-olds ready to take my place. So get closer to the food you eat, and you just might fall in love. Thank you.